The views and opinions expressed by the participants on this show are not necessarily those of Stewart Information Services Corporation or Stewart Title. Before you make any investment, you should seek the advice of your investment advisor or attorney. So Texas is doing well, and that's why it's the ninth ranked best state in job growth the latest 12 months. When it comes to real estate, everything matters. Whether you're a realtor, homeowner, buyer, or seller, Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title is here to inform, entertain, and inspire you. Host Bill Knappick from Stuart Title will talk with guests about what really matters when it comes to owning, buying, and selling real estate. Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title starts right now. Here's your host, Bill Knappick. And welcome to the show, Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title. I am your host, Bill Knappick, hosting the show and developing business sometimes at the same time. We are brought to you every week by Stuart Insurance and Risk Management, their president, Tom Carpentier. So whether you're listening here in Houston, Texas, the Woodlands, Dallas, Dana Point, California, anywhere else, we think you'll enjoy the show. We always have interesting guests. Today, we have a very special guest. He is Dr. Ted C. Jones, Stuart Title's chief economist. And prior to Stuart Title, Ted served as the chief economist at Texas A&M's University Real Estate Center. That's the nation's largest publicly funded real estate research group. And as I like to say, he is the eighth wonder in the real estate world. Dr. Jones, welcome to the show. Well, it's nice to be back. Uh, By the way, my friends call me Ted. So Ted yeah. Jones, here he is. Yes, sir. Well, let's tell people, first of all, chief economist at a great company like Stuart Title around over 124 years. I lost count. Let's tell people what you do there. You know, 20 years ago when I was hired, uh, uh, first of all, I had two jobs originally. I was director of investor relations. Most people do not realize that Stuart Title, which is owned by Stuart Information Services Corporation, is traded on New York Stock Exchange. We essentially do uh, uh, real estate transaction and real estate related issues in all 50 states and up to 20 countries each year. So uh, director of investor relations for a while, but all 20 years I've been chief economist for Stuart Title Guarantee Company. What that is, and I got to write my own job description on that. My That's job, fun. <laughs> yeah, my job, and it's one sentence, my job is to provide internal and external customers data and analysis to allow them to make better informed decisions. Hopefully that's what we'll do today. Indeed we will, and you do so in a magnificent way consistently, not just here but everywhere you go. And you have, a, many people know, certainly here in Houston, but around the United States, you have a very busy traveling and speaking schedule. Let's tell people a little bit about that and where maybe they can see you in the future. Well, uh, for example, this past week, I spoke in Houston. Uh, rare that I'm home, but I spoke at the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. I spoke at Martha Turner Sotheby's, which you've actually been at before too, Bill. I That's understand. right. <laughs> what, a, what a great organization that is. Um, in the last couple of months, I've spoke everywhere from the New England Land Title Association. That's seven different states up in the Northeast. Uh, speak to uh, uh, Miami uh, Association of Realtors Regional Convention. Um I was in Vail just a couple of weeks ago with our company with some of our top independent agency network in the southwestern U.S. Um, speak at everything from uh, the later later this week is so next week is Association of Commercial Real Estate Professionals. So a very very group of people everything from the realtors to the builders to uh, chambers of commerce to uh, developers to lenders. So it's a, it's a wide array of people. And what's interesting too, you share so much great information as you have a passion for being an economist. And I know you're up in the wee hours of the morning looking at things, creating top 10 lists on your blog, which people can go to stuart.com. But also as you are in these great places speaking, you are there also learning from these different markets. That's fascinating. You know, I've always said that the uh, if you want to talk real estate and you want to talk housing, I think the real estate agents that is active in the local market knows more about that market than anyone else because they not only see the values, I'm an appraiser by trade. We look at history, we look at what values of things that have sold, but that real estate agent sees the motives of the buyer and seller. They know the intricate details of each property because they've been in them and walked through them, they've home, held open homes in them. So I'm kind of a real pro realtor person when it comes to understanding local real estate. It is a local business, particularly in housing. And let's first start with your observations right now of the Houston market for those local realtors and homeowners, buyers and sellers out there listening right now. What's going on in Houston? You know, the amazing thing is, and we're, we're still sitting here today, I think this morning when I looked, and I do start at four in the morning. So. <laughs> we're, we're both early so, birds, yes. Yeah, it was, it was mid $40 for West Texas Intermediate Crude. We're only, you know, three and a half years ago, we were at $120 a barrel four years ago. Um, the last oil downturn before this one, Houston lost almost 5% of its total jobs. That's the entire metropolitan statistical area. That's literally from Conroe to Galveston and 
as far on each direction if you want to look at that. This time, uh, in this downturn, even though we're trading in those mid-40 range, we've actually, in the latest 12 months, added 51,000 net new jobs. Now, I'm going to brag here. Here in Houston. In, in, that's the entire, entire metropolitan statistical area. Uh, the Houston, the Woodlands, and Sugarland, and it includes also things like Galveston and sure. all that type of stuff. I'm going to brag here because my forecast for the year was 50,000, so I'm 1,000 off. That's not bad at all. Once again, on track. Jobs are everything. And, and of course... I've always said this, there's three kinds of people that do not need a job to purchase a home. They have gray hair, blue hair, or no hair. That means they're retirees. And and so you really need jobs. And 51000 is bad. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about Houston in contrast to the U.S. Our job growth rate in the last 12 months was 1.7%, 1.70%. The U.S. is 1.55%. Houston, even though oil is below $50 a barrel, is still growing jobs at a 10% greater pace than the U.S. overall. And and so that's, if you think about it, that's equating into um, uh, housing sales. So what I did is I took a look um, at the five major counties of the Houston Metropolitan Statistical Area, Brazoria County, Fort Bend, Harris, and Montgomery, uh, and Galveston. And if you look below a half million dollars, uh, in the first six months this year, the Houston Association of Realtors, through their multiple listing service system, sold 33,137 closings, single-family homes. That's a 5.9% increase from last year. If you look at the last four years, and, and remember in 2014, we had $120 barrel oil till June. In 2014, we only sold 30,000, less than 30,800. So we're up 5.9% year over year. So we actually sold in the first six months this year more single-family homes below a half million dollars than any time in history. So then let's just kind of ratchet up that scale and let's look at the next interval. And if you go from a half million to just below 750,000, we sold uh, 2,096. Again, that's the most we've sold ever in that first six-month period. That's up 9. Ever. Ever. It's up 9.5%. In June of this year, just for the month of June, the Houston Association of Realtors sold more homes than any time in history for any month. Astounding. So, and so people keep telling me, well, when's the economy going to come back? And I'm telling them, oh, evidently, it already <laughs> has. Yeah. <laughs> and then let's ratchet up to three quarters of a million to $999,999. We sold 657 Again, that's an all-time record in single-family homes. That's up 20%, more, slightly more than 20% from a year ago, uh, 657 And then if you look at million dollars and up, uh, we we closed 758 transactions in those five major Houston counties. Uh, again, that's the most ever. So, uh, and and the nice thing is, what's really good about that, in the first three months this year, our high end markets were very soft. We just didn't have a lot of activity there, and a lot of people are now saying, you know what? Uh, and there's a reason for it. We'll talk about it later. Why is the economy doing so good at, at mid forty dollar barrel oil? And and we'll talk about that now. If you want to talk about townhouse condos, because and, and, and you have to realize this, townhouse condos uh, make up, and I'm not, I'm not going to include a mid-rise and high-rise. We're going to do condos that are you know, like three, four stories or less. That makes up about uh, 10% of the total housing sales in Houston. We're, we're a single-family town. We, we like Everything's big in Texas, including our houses, including our yards and what have you. But again, in, in every one of those price ranges, below half million, that was up 4.1% all-time record. Uh, below, uh, from a half million to just below three quarters of a million, we're up 41.9% from a year ago on townhouse condos. Uh, that's an all-time record. From 750000 to 999999 we closed 23 of those. Uh, the previous highs were in 15 and 16. We closed 21 in 2014 when oil was a... 100 bucks, 120 bucks a barrel for half a year. We only closed 19. And the only one that didn't beat the all time record, at least on townhouse condos, was uh, we only closed six of those above a million dollars in the first half this year versus eight in 2014. Now, the one that is down, and you know, got to tell the truth good news, bad news, it's all news. You need it. If you look at our mid and high rise condo sales, um, good news is that um, we're, we're selling some. Worse than that, though, is that uh, we've built so many new Class A apartments in the last three and a half years. That if and when I say we built some really nice high rise, some apartments. really nice ones. And when you say Class A, that's the best of the best. It is, and we're talking granite countertops and you know, uh, stained master carpet, all those things. great views. 
super locations. You don't build that type of property except in super location. And our sales, uh, good news is we're up year over year below three quarters of a million. Uh, we're down above three quarters of a million. Uh, but we're not setting records in any of those categories right now. But the, the reason is that people don't have to buy it today. They can actually go rent it. And there's been so much of that available that some of the, the builders that three years ago started these new high-rise condos, um, they thought, say, for example, it might rent for $4,000. Um, they might get 4000 a day, but they're going to throw in three or four months free rent, which means they've shaved that asking price, rental price, by 25 to 33%. So it's a great time for people that want to rent and experience that style of living. You don't have to buy for the long term to do that. Uh, that said, though... I still think with that surplus out there, we're going to see some good buying opportunities, that that product and that price range. And, of course, as you're describing all this, I'm envisioning right near our corporate office, Stuart Title, right there on Post Oak. <laughs> it's happening all the time there, and it's interesting to see what's going to emerge because some of them are still in the early building stages, and then there's some beautiful ones already ready to go. I'm picturing that as you say this. It is, you know, and so, so we have opportunities out there, but uh, – uh, from a from a buyer perspective, if you're not looking at town at high rise and mid rise condos, uh, it's a pretty tight market out there. Uh, I'll just back up and we'll look at single family housing real quick. Uh, we think six months is normal. Below a half million dollars in single family, we have three point six months. So that means it's a seller's market. If you look at a half million to three quarters of a million dollars, we have eight point three months. We have roughly ten months and a three quarter million, but we've always had more. Uh, months inventory and the more expensive things. And and even at a million dollar up single family homes in those five counties, we have less than 12 months. It's 11.6 months. So um, if you look at condos below half a million, we have four months. Um, now the mid-rise, high-rise condos were 8.4 months. So uh, again, it, it, in months inventory. This is why, and I always say this, you probably get more value from a realtor today than any time in history, whether you're a buyer or seller. Because when you have a shortage of inventory, like we do in single family and our townhouse condos, or you have a surplus of inventory like we do in our mid-rise, high-rise because of the Class A apartment construction, which is a substitute property, you really need that informed seasoned veteran to advise you if you're listing your property for sale, what do I need to do to change it? Do I declutter it? Do I need to paint? Do I need to do this? Or if you're a buyer, um, they may be asking this, but what can I get it for? Uh, and in, in some of this buying, uh, don't think you're going to get it cheap in single family, particularly below a half million or even townhouse condos, because we're seeing many properties still selling for in excess of the original listing price because people of the shortage inventory, 3.6 months below a half million in single family. And also the realtors are saying when you price the home right, that puts it in that position to sell more than the asking price. We hear that all the time. It really does. And of course, and there's all kinds of studies, staging and other things like that help. Um, uh, intriguing that uh, uh, that's where your, your consummate real estate professional, that realtor, can really help you with that. And I would say, too, I think it's very interesting if you're buying or selling to look at HAR.com. Even look at the price range that you're not in. For example, I did this the other day looking at homes that are five, six million, which I'll never buy. But it's interesting to see how they present that product. And even when you see that, you see uh, staging faux pas that are taking place. So you're saying, like, wait a second. But you can learn from everything on that HAR. As I mentioned earlier this week, I spoke at Sotheby's at their group meeting. And uh, for the first time ever, uh, I saw a, um, a digital staging in photographs where the house is actually empty. And, and yet, if you go to HAR.com and you look at the pictures online, it'll show you what that would look like with furniture in it. So technology is very, very important in our play. But that uh, personal realtor's touch is so important in negotiations on price. Very interesting. We are talking to Ted C. Jones, Chief Economist at Stewart Title. Also, Ted, what are some of the other things for realtors that are listening? Give them an, another word about the Houston market and some of the th things that they should know as they serve buyers and sellers every day. You know, um, we've had a this year, one of the major trends we're seeing is, a, and, it, it, and it had disappeared since 08, and we've seen it for the last 12 months. We've seen a resurgence of the first time home buyer coming back to the marketplace, not just in Houston, but nationwide. Um, Again, one of the events I was at this week, uh, one of the home builders said they had started 100 spec homes and sold them all. They thought they would hold wow. them three months. And so we're seeing just tremendous demand. Yes, interest rates have trickled up slightly. But I would also challenge people today. <clears throat> Last year, the typical person, typical home seller that sold their home in 2016 had owned that home 7.88 years. 
so less than eight years. And yet we all go out and get 30-year fixed rate loans. And there's a big premium today for a 30-year fixed rate loan. I was at uh, Amogee Bank yesterday, for example, and I asked them, so Fannie and Freddie are now buying these mortgages. Fannie and Freddie don't make loans. They're government-sponsored enterprises. They buy loans that are already made that are under all the qualifying ratios, good stuff, and they securitize it, take it to the secondary market, and sell it to investors. Fannie and Freddie are now buying loans that have a five- to seven-year fixed duration, so the interest rate doesn't change. So it's just like a 30-year fixed rate loan. And let's say you get a seven-year one, for example. In the eighth year, the maximum your interest rate on your payment can go up is 1%. So yesterday, MG was saying, or not yesterday, this past week, they said that uh, we're making that loan today for 2.875%. My goodness, a 30-year fixed rate loan is at 4%. And you talk about supersizing. If you just want to buy a monthly payment, you can actually buy a lot more house if you get that seven-year fixed rate loan. And uh, not only that, if you think you're going to be here seven or eight years, uh, hey, what a great deal to get that type of loan. And so... Um, even though interest rates have gone up, we still see interest rates, which I think are still among the lowest I've ever seen in my lifetime. Now, you have to realize, when I was a professor at Texas A&M, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on interest rates, how high rates used to be. And also, before we take a break, tell us, as far as the Houston area, there are so many parts of the Houston area. What are Is there some that are faster than others, like the Woodlands, Katy? Give us a word on, on some of those pockets. <laughs> We're actually seeing, you know, if you want to look at it, our outer line markets, we used to call them suburban markets, and they've become cities unto themselves, whether it's Sugarland or Katy or Conroe or Pearland even. Um, but those are, are more moderately priced. You know, we, we're seeing more homes in, in the typical Houstonians range. Anytime you get near or inside the loop, just because of the cost of land, uh, you're seeing a, a more a wealthier individual or higher cash flow individual. You know, it's not uncommon to see a, a six or 8,000 square foot lot inside the loop selling for over a half million dollars. And in very those are all naturally old homes that are being bulldozed. I drove past one on the way here today in my neighborhood, and it's all bulldozed in. And I think the home next to it, they're asking $1.1 million for it. I do not live in a $1.1 million home. I want to put that up front. Right. <laughs> but I drive through a nice neighborhood, so I got to see that. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ted C. Jones, Stewart Titles Chief Economist. We're going to come back with much more from Ted. Stay with us. We're coming right back. Stuart Title has been serving Texas for over 120 years. A Texas treasure, Stuart Title's longevity is a testimony to superior service, innovation, and knowing what their customers want. Recent surveys show that 92% of respondents want secure online tracking tools to help them during the closing process. Stuart Title offers the most robust and secure system to track transactions online available today. To learn more, contact Stuart Title at one of their many offices around the city. Stuart Title, online at stuart.com. That's S T E W A R T.com. And welcome back, Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title. I am your host, Bill Nampa. Today, our special guest. Ted C. Jones, Stewart Title's Chief Economist. Ted, welcome back. Nice to be here. <laughs> so let's keep talking real estate, Houston, and everything else, and the nation even. At our first segment, we talked about Houston, the conditions, what you're seeing right now. Let's take a broader look because you're all over and studying everything going on in the country and even beyond. What's going on outside of Houston? So first of all, we'll just talk the nation. Um, you know, Wall Street um, is very upbeat about the economy because uh, since the election, the stock market's gone up. Interest rates have gone up. They've gone up because they believe that uh, the reduction in regulations, the incentives to do business in the U.S. will actually stimulate growth within the country and create jobs. As always, I say jobs are absolutely everything. Now, that said, our job growth in the latest 12 months, ending uh, June of this year, is 1.55%. That's kind of tepid, believe it or not. And we, we've, in the latest 12 months, we added 2.238 million net new jobs. <laughs> I'm going to rewind back to uh, the 12 months ending February 2015. We added almost 3.2 million net new jobs. 
So you can see we're not performing at the level we should. But I expect that this job growth rate will grow. Now, one of the questions I always get, yeah, yeah, but we're heading to a recession, aren't we, Ted? And the answer is, I don't see that at all. Uh, recession, first of all, if you hear a reporter, and I don't care if you're left, leaning or right leaning there's fake news every place let's just put it out abundance there. yes of that and so i'm gonna i'm gonna throw everyone in that that bin of that but i heard a news commentator just about a month ago state that uh, the president has put the u.s in a recession a recession is defined as two consecutive quarters of negative gdp we do not have that we are not in a recession but i actually have a better indicator of that and recessions are driven by people when they lack confidence they may have the money they just don't buy the new car They don't take that vacation because they're concerned about the future. So my, I call it confidence gauge, happens to be employment and leisure and hospitality industries. You and I do not spend money on leisure and hospitality unless we feel very good about the future. And uh, I'm talking about cruises or or big vacations or very expensive dinners or one-time faraway sporting events or spas or dude ranches, all that kind of stuff. Remember, our U.S. overall employment rate's 1.55%. The employment rate growth rate in the leisure and hospitality is 2.01%. What that simply says is we're growing a third faster in leisure and hospitality. In fact, uh, I heard this, uh, didn't verify it, but I'm pretty sure it's true. In the first quarter of this year, the U.S. cruise ship industry booked more cabins for cruise boats than any quarter in history. And that all says, and I feel good about the future, and I'm spending money. And uh, that's good news. Now, part of the reason we're spending money is we're not spending as much money on consumer debt as we used to. Now, you look at it, go back to 06, uh, and, and got to be careful about how I form this because not everyone has a house loan. Not everyone has a car loan. Not everyone has college loans. But if you look at everyone in aggregate, the total spending of take-home pay on college loans, car loans, and house loans was 13.2 cents of every take-home dollar back in 06. Today, it's 10 cents. It's almost a 30% reduction in debt service on three primary things. I would like to just segue real quick into college loans, okay? There are, um, are college loans bad? No, not necessarily. The guru of college loans, and by the way, if you read my Twitter account, you'd already know this because I tweet this type of information. The guru of college loans nationwide says college loans are okay as long as when you graduate, graduate from college, that your total college loans do not exceed your first year salary. If that's the case, you can fully amortize that college loan over 10 years and in that same period purchase a home at the same time simultaneously. So we have two groups of people that are in trouble on college loans. The first group is the group of people that have college loan debt (laughs) and they never got the degree. Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas did a study uh, eight years ago. They looked at the typical Texas college graduate versus the non-college graduate in Texas. And that Texas college graduate earns 97%, literally double what the non-college grad does. So if you have college loans, you didn't get the degree, you don't have the capability to pay that loan back. If you got the college degree, you do. And the other group of people are the people that are just, well, forgive me, they're just stupid. People I sat on an airplane with a lady who had $141,000 in college <laughs> debt, and, and and she had just put her plane ticket on her college loan to go party with their girlfriends because they graduated from college. That, that, come on. It's going to be paying for that college loan for another 30 years. Let's get, be real. Not a it. good financial move, no. So what we've done is we, we just haven't increased our consumer debt as much, so consumers have a lot more money in their pockets. The other thing is cheap energy. Compared to 2014, the average – Driver this year compared to 2014 is going to be spending $550 less this year than they did the same car in 2014 driving around just on fuel costs. Look at a married couple or a couple with two teenage drivers. That's four people. That's $2,200. So our economy is in great shape today. Well, also, you mentioned about following you on Twitter. Let's tell people how they can do that. But I also want to mention the things that you have on the website, the Stuart.com, the blogs. And we can talk about this as well. You have on your post another. You have you, you, everybody loves a top ten list, especially when you do it. You have the best states for business in 2017. You have states with the greatest expectations for home renovation, the best markets to buy a vacation, the top ten best markets to buy a vacation home, and I love this one: the hottest and and coldest housing markets in the world. So for people that want to learn more and they're not looking at your blog or Twitter right now, 
they're missing out because all this stuff is simply there at Stewart.com. And what's the Twitter handle? Twitter handle is DR, as in Dr. TCJ, Ted C. Jones. DRTCJ. There you go. DRTCJ, and you'll get me. Well, one of them you forgot, uh, one of my favorite ones lately was the cost of energy. Oh, that's right. You, you yes. know, you, you look at a consumer, and whether it's our cars, our homes, the energy costs, uh, particularly when oil is $120 per barrel, was a major component. In fact, we argued back in 1973 that when OPEC cut back uh, energy production, that energy costs were actually the biggest tax that the consumer paid. Unfortunately, our government didn't get any of that revenue. It went overseas. And uh, so I really love this one on, on energy. Um, and, for example, it's just not the cost of energy, but it's the amount of energy that you use. Um, uh, even you, you, you you look at Connecticut, uh, uh, the, while their energy cost is a little expensive, they don't use much. New York's the same way. Kind of hard to use a lot of energy in a 500-square-foot uh, apartment in downtown Manhattan. <laughs> Even you if you have, try. <laughs> and you don't have a car. So so you got to put all Good that point. together. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, nat- naturally, uh, not surprisingly, uh, high-energy costs are typically associated with either very warm climates on air conditioning, uh, or they're associated with extremely cold climates. And in Alaska, no one's going to be surprised, has the second highest energy cost in the nation on their total use per household. So That's great stuff, Ted. Also, let's tell people as we talk about outside of Houston, some of the, I don't know, top five or some of the, the hot markets that, that are in your, that, in your attention right now around the United States. Well, again, it's going to be all about job growth. And, and I'm going to listen. First of all, remember this, that the U.S. job growth is 1.55%. So let's look, first of all, just the state level where job growth is most. Uh, Utah's number one in the latest 12 months in job growth, 12 months ending May. We don't have the, the June data for that yet. 3.28%. Utah is growing jobs at more than double the rate of the U.S., and you got to ask why. A lot of it, uh, if you look at San Jose, Silicon Valley, it's literally you know the, the world's Silicon Valley. It is the world's technology center. That world's technology center is getting so expensive to live in. And simply lack of availability of housing and high cost that uh, we've actually got a couple spinoffs. We have one of those spinoffs in Texas. Austin, Texas is one of those uh, those micro technology centers. Uh, Provo or, or uh, Ogden, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah is another one. Fort Collins, Col- Fort Collins, Colorado is another one. Number two job growth is Florida. Uh, why is Florida doing so well? Um, the Tax Foundation each year, but you'd know this if you read my blog, <laughs> Tax Foundation each year ranks all 50 states based on five taxes, corporate income tax, personal income tax, retail sales tax, unemployment tax, and property tax. Florida is the fourth best place to do business with in the entire United States. Now, business environment-wise, number one, two, and three, no one's going to probably relocate a typical business there. They happen to be Wyoming, South Dakota, and Alaska. But Florida, just an example, in the last five years, they've gotten companies to relocate plants such as Caterpillar. Uh, Hertz put their global headquarters in southwest Florida. You know, if you have low taxes and a nice nice environment, uh, it's a great place to do business. Years ago when I was in college, one of my professors was st- ranked one of the top 100 economists of all time by the London School of Economics, and it was, why do companies locate where they locate? And the first one was it had to have jet service. Second one, it had to have interna- uh, interstate highways. The third one, it had to have rail service. And the fourth one, it had to be a place where the CEO wanted to live. And, uh, you know, Florida fits that to a lot of things. General Electric, for example, while they're relocating their major campus from Connecticut into Boston, their human resources and property taxes and everything have been running out of Fort Myers the last uh, 30 years because it's a nice place to go. Third best state, Nevada. Uh, you look at the – again, it's a very business-friendly state to do business with, one of the top ten. Idaho next. Why is Idaho doing so well? Well, if you look at it, when you hear this list, the Pacific Northwest and Southwest are doing good, and those people like to go to the mountains. And Idaho's got mountains. But a lot of those people in the Pacific Northwest, West Coast, and Southwest have been priced out of Aspen and Vail and Telluride. You can buy a property in Idaho, that mountain cabin, that ski resort, that condo, for an incredibly affordable price. So, again, the cost of doing business comes into play. Next one's Colorado. Colorado's blowing and going. And it's a function of a lot of things. Colorado uh, does well in the U.S. economy. Colorado does extremely well when the U.S. economy does good. And it does extremely bad when the economy does bad. 
that's because it's a more expensive state, but a lot of people, uh, when they have excess money in their pocket, they go there and spend money quite a bit. Um, next one's Oregon. Again, it's it's a lifestyle. It's it's uh, Pacific Northwest. It's a good place to do business with. A beautiful Forty place. Tax Foundation. Georgia is another one, and Georgia is really just coming back in its own. It's, to me, it's one of the last states to recover from the housing bubble. It's blowing and going because it's a very affordable place to do business. And then the last three, state of Washington, uh, Boeing Aircraft last year delivered more new jetliners any time in history. They're going to do that again. Number nine of the top ten is Texas. This is phenomenal. Three years ago when oil prices fell, it just didn't impact Houston. It impacted everything in West Texas and even up in Fort Worth on oil and gas exploration. We are now ninth best in the country. We were at the bottom of the third middle group at uh, literally three years ago. And then rounding that out is Tennessee. Tennessee has got uh, several new car plants, car manufacturing plants. Volkswagen, for example, in the last 18 months opened a new plant. Uh, so they're blowing and going. And now, so you got it to get good. Let's look at where the bad's at. We're, we're state losing the most jobs in the country is Wyoming. It's cheap oil, gas, and coal. Wyoming's the number one coal producer in the U.S. West Virginia, coal is the second worst. Alaska, oil and gas number three. Kansas, number four. Uh, why is Kansas doing bad? Have you ever driven across it? Yeah. Yes, we'll I have. leave it that. Oklahoma, <laughs> Many Mississippi, times. Louisiana next. So, so you look at those states that are doing well, and those are phenomenal uh, communities. That said, now if I want to talk about major towns that are doing well, you can always say this. If it's a major college town, typically a state capital or a technology center, they always do well. And so, uh, you know, you always want to, if you want to go where the economy is always good, go to one of those type three towns. All right, let's set the binoculars outside of Houston, but close by. And I was thinking as you're talking about jobs coming in from other places, I think I heard that it was Plano, that Toyota moved a plant to Plano recently. So how about our friends, generally speaking, our friends in the Dallas area? And then let's hit San Antonio and Austin a little bit. Well, we'll, we'll talk about job growth because those numbers tell it all. Yeah. Actually, in Plano, it wasn't a car plant that Toyota moved there. It was their North American headquarters, and they're relocating 4,800 jobs there and people there. And these are extremely well-paying jobs. Uh, Plano is blowing and going. It's uh, highly affordable. It's connected to a city. It's uh, in, in, literally in the last three years, Dallas is consistently in the one of the top three to five housing markets in the country. Uh, if you think there's no inventory, we have some zip codes in Dallas that have less than one month inventory. There's just nothing available for sale, so home prices are blowing and going. But that said, if we, if we look at um, just the Dallas uh, Irving uh, Plano Metro, their job growth is 3.46%. Remember, the U.S. is 1.55%. Look at Dallas Fort Worth overall, it's 3.17%. Uh, Austin, Texas, 2.84%, a little shy of 3%, not quite double the U.S., but still massively impressive. San Antonio, 2.21%. Um, Remember, the U.S. is 1.55%. Um, so, you know, these Texas, major Texas cities are doing extremely well. El Paso, for example, 2.72%. Uh, so Texas is doing well, and that's why it's the ninth-ranked best state in job growth in the latest 12 months. It is a great state, and, and I would think that if you if someone were to talk to you outside of Houston and they would say, there's someone, let's say, right out of college, and they said, Ted, should I move to Texas? <laughs> or, or if they said, Ted, what state should I move to if well, I want to get a good job? I know well, it's a general question, but what would you say? Well, as an economist, here, here's my rule. I cannot live in a state that has a state income tax. I'm, I'll so drink that, to that. So that narrows it down to about 10 of them. So uh, a Texas, Florida, Tennessee come to mind real quick. There you go. No doubt about that. Also, let's talk a little bit about back to Houston. People, I hear different uh, statistics about the amount of people coming to Houston on a regular basis. They're arriving with a new job or looking for jobs. Give us a feel for those that are relocating to Houston, whether they have a job or not. Do you know the numbers or what's the feel well, I, there? I don't know the numbers, but I actually wrote a blog on it this year, and it was uh, featuring U-Haul. U-Haul. Oh. And, and even though, uh, and you can go see it, uh, and if you if you don't remember Stuart.com, just Google Jones on Real Estate. It will take you to Stuart.com. Jones on Real Estate is my blog name. But uh, Houston, despite it, even then we were having tepid job growth about uh, six months ago when I wrote this blog, we were still the number one destination for people on one-way truck rentals across the entire United States of America. So if you want to see where things are happening, either look at the big uh, major line moving companies or things such as U-Haul, and they'll tell you where things are happening real quick. 
There you go. Stewart.com. Jones on real estate. And of course, people, uh, if they just Google your name, Ted, so many things come up of value. And let's tell them the Twitter handle once again. Twitter is DRTCJ. DRTCJ. Very nice. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Economist at Stewart Title, Ted Jones. He's coming back with even more. Stay with us. Fascinating. You're listening to Real Estate Matters. We're coming right back. Most people don't know that Stewart offers business, home, and auto insurance. In fact, Stewart Insurance and Risk Management has been doing that and more for over 10 years. And they partner with many leading insurance companies to offer great rates. They're a national insurance agency operating in all 50 states, delivering a broad range of insurance products. Whether you need a home insurance quote for a client's home closing or your own insurance needs, you can count on them. Call 866-845-4676. That's 866-845-4676. Stewart Insurance and Risk Management is here to help. And welcome back. Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title, your host, Bill Nampick. And as always, every week for 181 shows, I think this is 181, Stewart Insurance and Risk Management, where you can get home, auto, those pillars of personal insurance and commercial insurance. You can get it all day long at Stuart.com. She is with us. Everybody loves to hear Brittany Taggart with Stewart Insurance and Risk Management. Brittany, welcome back to the show. Why, thank you, Bill. Appreciate being here. I love well, being here. Yeah, and listening to Ted, I, I realize all how important and the indicators are right in front of us of what's going on you just have to to look at them and and of course it's it's hard to look at them and study them in the way ted does but it's fascinating to hear that and, and his blogs and stuff is just is great stuff it absolutely is i think something that uh, he said that really resonates with me is that first thing about his job description providing uh, information for both internal and external customers to make better decisions and i immediately think of course i apply everything that i hear um, back to our business because that's really we look to provide our customers with information to equip them to make their decisions when it comes to proper insurance. We've said it before, and and proper insurance is, is very different for everybody. So uh, that's definitely something that we look to do is provide insurance or information for people to make proper decisions for their insurance. And also, as I said, Brittany, mm -hmm. people think about Stewart Title. We, we're glad that they do, and we appreciate their business yes, so much do. for all these many years, not just in Houston, but around the United States. However, Absolutely. every once in a while, people forget that we don't just have title insurance, but they can get their home, like I have my home insurance with the Stewart Insurance and Risk Management, home, auto, flood insurance, umbrella policies. And if you're a broker, certainly that broker, e and is you guys are specialists in all those things and more. Yeah, I think the uh, specific thing that you said is that describes us as being specialists. So uh, for those who don't know, we our company is Stewart Insurance and Risk Management. We are owned by Stewart Title Company, which is a real estate services company. So naturally, Stewart Insurance and Risk Management focuses within the real estate industry. So when you mentioned uh, home insurance, that really is our lead in because we we help home buyers who are going through that real estate transaction. That's our, our main uh, focus is to really help those individuals. And we have the auto, we have the flood, the wind, everything else that you need when it comes to your personal insurance. And then on the business side for the business insurance, we insure those who operate within the real estate industry. Like you mentioned, the real estate brokers, the title and attorney agents, uh, lenders, uh, people like that who operate within real estate. And the beauty is that you don't just have the insurance because a lot of people have the insurance. A lot of companies out there, they have the insurance, but you help in a great way of navigating the individual through the process, answering the questions that they didn't even ask to, to <laughs> give them a better experience and to give them better coverage. And many times they'll save money. We were just talking about it today, actually, how much... Uh, the entire industry is moving towards online, which is amazing. People like to do business sometimes online, but that off-ramp will always be there. People will always want to talk to an individual, especially when it comes to topics such as insurance, when they're so comp sometimes complicated, there's many moving parts. People do want to talk to a knowledgeable professional. And for insurance, for our company, that's where we will always look to specialize. Robots really can't replace that human just yet, at least po possibly in our lifetime. Um, I don't think we're underestimating it, but to really mimic talking with a person, there's so many nuances that would have to be coded that it's not going away anytime soon, we believe. 
and insurance is only complicated if you read the policy. <laughs> I mean, that's all, <laughs> that's why we you, do what, it. That's, that's why <laughs> I ask, when I talk about my home insurance or, or possibly buying that second uh, vacation home, I say, okay, tell me what I need to know because I'm not going to read this policy. I don't want to. It's just well, too it's tedious. A good, a good insurance agent will take the complicated and make it simple for their customers. Exactly. So you can really explain the components of what is home insurance really supposed to insure you for. Um, and having somebody to be able to lay that out for you very simply so you can make an informed decision. Again, just getting that information in a simplified way to make a, an informed Say decision. Say that again, please. A good insurance agent is going to... Make the complicated simple. Indeed. And I want to give the hats off. I talked to one of your associates there, Jamie, who did a tremendous job of serving me as I had a question. He answered, answered it and gave me information that I didn't even know to ask. Also, Brittany, let's tell people again how they can reach out. Possibly they want to get a quote on their home, auto, or anything else. Well, like I mentioned, we do like to speak with our customers. It, we just provide a better experience that way. So you can reach us at 866-845-4676. You can always find us on Stuart.com. Um, and I know we've been talking about Twitter as well. So our Twitter handle is at InsureRisk. And the number again, mm-hmm. just a little bit yes. slower. 866-845-4676. All right. <laughs> Brittany Taggart. And of course, go to Stuart.com. It, it is a, a site. A, well done. Our marketing team does a tremendous site on our website, not just having the full archives of all of our shows, but presenting the insurance on the very first page as they hover over insurance on Stuart.com. It has all of Ted's blogs and so much more. Ladies and gentlemen, Brittany Taggart. One more time, that phone number, Brittany? That phone number is 866-845-4676. Thank you so much. You are listening to Real Estate Matters. That was Brittany Taggart. We're coming back with Dr. Ted C. Jones of Stewart Title. More fascinating information on what makes the real estate market tick, what makes jobs tick, and everything else. We're coming right back. Stay with us. If you've been in the real estate industry for any length of time, you know unexpected and costly events can happen. Safeguard yourself against the unexpected with Real Estate Errors and Emissions Insurance, or ENO, through Stewart Insurance and Risk Management. Not all ENO insurance policies are created equal. How confident are you that your current ENO policy fully protects you? Stewart Insurance and Risk Management offers expertise in the real estate industry and tailors your coverage to correctly manage your risk. With Stewart Insurance and Risk Management, facing the unexpected just became a lot easier. Safeguard your future with real estate ENO insurance through Stewart Insurance and Risk Management. Call today at 866-845-4676. That's 866-845-4676. Or email us at stewartinsurance at stewart.com to request tailored insurance options for you and your business. And welcome back. Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title, your host, Bill Nappick, here with Ted C. Jones, Stuart Title's chief economist. Even more information awaits. Ted, welcome back. Greetings again. Honored to be here. Well, let's let's talk about a few things. First of all, I want to hit, you have some acronyms out there, but I love what, as I was reading your blog, la, blog last night at three in the morning, it came across, it's, there is no such thing as a national real estate market. Give us the acronym for that. Well, and uh, how you came up with that. I love well, that. If you <laughs> use the first letter of everything, T, there is no such thing, T I N S, and it goes on from there. There's no such thing as the national real estate market. There's no such thing as the national economy. And there's no such thing as, for example, the, the, the best everything, because every place is local and specific in nature. Uh, one of our, our founding family members used to always say, We are one of the best local global companies you'll ever do business with. And I love that stating. So, yeah, there's no such thing as a national real estate market. Even within Houston, we have neighborhoods that are hotter than hot and others that are not. We have price ranges and product types that are hot and others that are not. That's true in every major city across the United States of America. Excellent. So now let's hit a few things before we leave. Interest rates. You uh, want to talk about interest rates. So interest rates today, you know, first of all, I said I wanted you to look at looking, getting perhaps a seven-year fixed rate loan from your lender instead of purchase, getting a 30-year fixed rate loan. The simple fact, the majority of people, the average last year that sold were, had their home 7.88 years. Uh, so that said, uh, let's put interest rates in perspective today. They're just hanging right at that 4% level for a 30-year fixed rate loan. 
Um, I can remember I was a professor at Texas a and I was chief economist at the Real Estate Center. And uh, in November of 89, I'd built a new home and I was doing my permanent financing and I closed on it. And, and I was so thrilled. I got nine and three quarters percent, 30 year <laughs> fixed rate loan. It was the first time in over 10 years it had been below 10 percent. And we got up almost to 20 percent. There were a few people that, depending on their loan characteristics, did pay over 20 percent. So I think today, even if uh, rates go up, and, and if you want to hear my forecast, I'm, I'm thinking that in the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to see 30 year fixed rate loans between 4.7. And 5.3%. And that's one of the reasons I want everyone starting thinking about these seven year fixed rate loans that uh, go up a maximum 1% per year after that. Because if I'm right and things do go to 5.3%, you can still get that doggone seven year fixed or around uh, 4% today. So technically, if you just change your type of loan instrument, um, you won't pay any more per month. So I, I'm not worried about rising rates in that interval impacting our housing market sales. Excellent. What about millennials, Ted? Oh, you know, I'm a boomer. Uh, Bill, Me you're too. a boomer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're a boomer if you're born between 1946 and 1964. <laughs> there happens to be uh, 76 million of us boomers. Uh, I hate to say this to you, Bill. Uh, young lady here won't get this one, but all the boomers are going to die. Yeah, and, and it is what it is. Uh, but uh, don't worry about that impacting the economy because between the ages of 19 and 35, there are 83 million millennials. If you go down to the age of 16, there's 91 million millennials. Last year, even though the most common age of millennials today is now 25, then 24, then 26, the most common age of the first time home buyer is 31. But last year, despite millennials as a group being way too young to buy their first home, they became the number one home buying segment in the United States of America. And we're just starting. That goes on for another 14 years. That said, if you're dealing with millennials, uh, we got to start communicating a little differently. They still speak English, don't get me wrong, but uh, a neat study done right at a year ago, open market, surveyed 500 millennials. And, and of course, you and I call our little thing a cell phone, a phone. And millennials very often call it their device because to them it does a lot more than a talk function. So open market asks these 500 millennials, would you mind losing the phone function of your device? And 75% said, no problem. Now, you and I would feel naked if we didn't have our cell phone function on the device. It all started with that. Uh, they, 76% of the millennials in that same survey said they prefer texting to talking. I, I'm sitting in meetings today, and I was able, had my phone wrong, it had been disruptive. And yet I was able to resolve an issue texting. And then uh, this is the one that's a gotcha, and this is how we need to start thinking differently and communicating differently with millennials. 19% stated they never, ever checked their voicemail. So let's say that you're a, a realtor or a lender that's doing a closing with a millennial and you leave them a voice message about you got to do this before we get there. And by the way, the closing has been moved to this time or date. You, you're literally going to have one out of five odds. That person's not going to close that transaction because they're not going to check their voicemail. So again, we need to start talking about tweeting and texting and Snapchatting and other issues like that. So y'all need to pick up my Twitter at DRTCJ. So, so millennials is a big one. And, and the other one, um, you know, of course, millennials literally for the next two decades will be our largest growth market. But within that, um, I want to look at the, the largest ethnic growing demographic in the United States of America, and that's Hispanics. There was a really neat uh, study that was done. It came out. Uh, it was released by the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. They called it their Hispanic Wealth Project. Um, just get get a few of these numbers. Hispanics accounted for 76.4% of the total labor force growth in the United States from 2010 to 2016. They don't make up 30% of our population, but they accounted for three-fourths of our job growth. Um, nearly 6 in 10 Hispanics are millennials or younger. <laughs> so, First of all, they're an ethnic group that's not even into their maximum earning capacity. In fact, they're not even into their first job capacity, if you think about that. Um, home ownership. Uh, between 2015 and 2016, the U.S. home ownership rate dropped from 63.7% to 63.4%. Hispanic home ownership rate among Hispanics went from 45.6% to 46%. 52% of uh, uh, Hispanics, excuse me, Hispanics will count, account for 52% of all new homeowners between 2010 and 2030. That's half. They're not half the population yet. You understand that they're, they're catching up from behind because they're young. 
they're just entering their home buying age. And if you look since 2010, Hispanics have accounted for 60% of the total homeownership growth up to now. And then lastly, uh, in 2016, we had 7.3 million Hispanic households that owned their homes. Just from 2015 to 2016, we had 209,000 new household creations. And literally in that just one year period, they accounted for 74.9%. Very explosive growth market. So in Texas, we're going to be blessed in growth for the next multiple decades, both by millennials and Hispanics, because they're just going to be entering their real economic stages of their life. And that's going to be massive demands on housing. They're going to fill a lot of jobs. And of course, our trick is to make sure that we have one of the best educated workforces in the country. And as always, people can look at you on Stewart.com. Follow your blog there, Twitter, DRTCJ. Also, before we close the show, Ted, uh, what about food? Now, we, we uh, always like to, to, to t- touch a little bit. We have here in Houston, and there's many great restaurants all over the world. But Houston, what, what are you thinking about uh, culinary-wise, and what restaurants have you been hitting lately, and what have you been ordering? All right, so. Very important. So, <laughs> I, all right, so I, I'm, I'm, we're a big fish fan, and um, – and uh, because of uh, dietary issues with family members, um, celiac and what have you on some family members, we've got to go to a restaurant we can trust. And, and I guarantee you, you cannot uh, have any bad issues at either Landry's or Papa's, both Houston-based companies. Uh, phenomenal seafood on both of them. Uh, just, just I, I will match their food to anyone across the country. Uh, yet we still have a lot of uh, uh, local mom and pops, barbecue pizzatolas. If you haven't been to Pizzatola, you ought to give it a try. It's very unique. Um, we, we just have so many great places in this town. You, you, if, if I started naming them, we'd be another hour and a half. Exactly. In fact, I, I do want to shout out to my good buddy, Johnny Carabu, who I got to talk to. I mean, the story that uh, as far as Houston, it's tied in. But great restaurants, great food all the time at Carabba's there at all his restaurants. But it's exciting. Not just great food in Houston at these restaurants, such as Carabba's, one of my favorites, too. But uh, we get a lot of bang for the buck. Oh, yeah. A lot of these are, are white linen table dining things. I guarantee if you go to New York City, it's double that and the food's not as good. And I go to L.A., it's double that and the food's not as good. So I think we are, we are blessed to live in Houston on the food side. Yeah. Now, my favorite, favorite meal I've had in the last three months, it's a little place up the coast in Kennebunkport. It's called Mabel's Lobster Claw. Oh, man, that sounds great. And, and, in fact, they don't even put the lobsters in the refrigerator because there's a boat that pulls up next to them and this boat dock next to it, and they go straight into the pot and straight on your plate, and it's a bargain eat there if you all ever want the best lobster in the world. Mabel's, Mabel's Lobster Claw in Kennebunkport. I'm on my way after the show. Ted, with the last minute, what else should people know? Anything. Great time to live in Houston. It's a great time to live in Texas. Um, one of the nice things is we're reducing regulatory issues across the U.S. That's going to help small business. Remember this, small business is accountable for 70% of all net job growth over the last three decades. Anything we can do to help them is going to be good news. That describes Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ted C. Jones, our friend, and we are so blessed to have Ted on the team at Stewart Title for these many years, serving real estate professionals, serving us internally as well. Thank you so much for listening to Real Estate Matters with Stewart Title, even though the show is ending at the time of broadcast, but it never really ends because it is Real Estate Matters on demand when you go to Stewart.com forward slash Houston. Again, Stewart.com forward slash Houston, and you can always see Ted Jones on Stewart.com. Follow his blogs, Twitter, D-R-T-C-J. Thank you, Brittany Taggart, Tom Carpentier, Matt Morris, and we will see you next week. Go to Stuart.com forward slash Houston. Thanks for listening, everybody.